see a cold morning. The roads are a little bit uh, sketchy in some places, so uh, those that are watching online, uh, we welcome you as well. And Maybe you're not watching right now with us, you're going to watch it later in the day, but uh, hopefully uh, the Lord blesses uh, you uh, from with this service, and hopefully we bless the Lord with our praise. I mean, that's the, that's the key there, I guess. Uh, now that I think about it, uh, a couple things I want to mention. Uh, just continue to pray for Pete uh, with his treatments and things that he's doing just every day. Uh, almost it seems like he has some kind of a, an appointment somewhere that they're driving somewhere and doing things and uh, testing and checking on him. Uh, so be praying for him and his family. Also be praying for Sue Klauka. Uh, she had an episode on Friday. Uh, it was Friday, right? And she had a heart cath, uh, an emergency heart cath done in Saginaw. But she is home now, uh, so be praying for her and uh, that she'll get stronger and, and things like that uh, from that. And uh, also, just to mention, March 6th is Men Modeling the Master. There's details on the bulletin board over there by the sort of in that hallway between the nursery. And that is going to be at, uh, I believe, South Baptist and Flint, uh, just off of Bristol Road, Van Slyke. So if that's something that you'd like to do, if maybe if there's a three or four guys that want to go, uh, we can carpool uh, together. If we get enough, maybe we'll take, even take the van if you'd like to do that. Uh, so certainly um, uh, consider that on March 6th. Also, in our business meeting we had there uh, last Sunday or the Sunday before, whenever I, I lose track in my head, uh, we talked about VBS and we have um, money that's uh, built up in that account. So there's a budget for VBS and it's not something that we've done in the last couple of years. Uh, formally, we've done things with CEF, but if we'd like to do that, uh, we have the money, we just need the, the people. Uh, we need the, the leadership. And if that's something that you're interested in doing, certainly speak to me and, and we will get that going and planning. And, and we would need just more than one person. We would need a team of people that we'd have to put together. So be praying about that. If there'd be somebody that would like to do that, um, we could get together soon. We would want to start planning as soon as possible. And um, I think that's all the announcements I would like to make necessarily. Uh, if there's something else that comes up, we will uh, mention it later. But let's go to Lord in prayer. Uh, Father God, we are thankful for this opportunity to gather together as believers and, and get together in this gospel-centered community. And Lord, at different times in our lives, we have distractions, we have frustrations, we have uh, at times even conflict. Sometimes we have uh, personal issues, we have guilt that we hang on to, and we have all these struggles, Lord, but uh, Lord, help us to confess those things to you and uh, place those burdens on you and, and just focus on your word this morning. Focus on the gospel. Focus on that, that uh, highest of all high is your son, Jesus Christ. And, and Father, uh, we, we do lift up those that would normally be here but can't. We think of Pete, uh, strengthen his body and just prepare him for this uh, tr transplant that he's going to be having, the bone marrow transplant. We pray for Sue, and we're thankful that she is doing better uh, with this 100% blockage that she experienced. And just pray for her that um, over the next few days that she will get her strength back and her energy back and all those things that I'm sure she sort of feels a little uh, bit different this morning. We think of uh, Nancy Goss as well that's still uh, trying to get 100% back to normal from uh, the heart uh, problems that she experienced. Lord, we think of, of, of Joel Bickle that uh, has been experiencing heart issues as well as a younger man at 39 years old, just uh, help him to figure out what's going on and the doctors and uh, Lord, we pray that the medication would work for him. And uh, Lord, I'm sure there's other aches and pains and issues that have been going on as well that we've talked about. We, we pray for Carrie as well to get stronger and stronger each day. And, 
and Lord, so many different things. And we've heard of people traveling and uh, give them safety on the roads as they, they go about their business. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. On page 50, I sing praises. chapter 9, starting at verse 24 and reading through 27, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, if you're using the Pew Bible, I believe that's on 860, 846, I knew there was a 6 there somewhere. Let's stand together in honor of God's word, Again, we will start at verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race run all, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. No, they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty, because I fight not as one who beats the air, 
but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest, when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. I'd like to ask the ushers if they come forward and take up the morning tithes and offerings. Our dearly Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, this morning as you have spoke to us through your word, we're all in this race. Lord, I just pray that we would run that race and discipline ourselves to compete in that race so that we show Christ through our lives to the world that we live in. Lord, we thank you for this place that we can come and worship you. And now as we take time to uh, take up this offering, we just pray that you would bless it, and it would honor you in uh, the administration of it. In praise in Jesus' name, amen. Every day with Jesus. You find that on 254 in your hymnal. Oh 
seated. Nathan, could you click, I think, one more time? There we go. That's what I wanted. Perfect. What a privilege it is this morning to get together and look into the Word of God. I was thinking this past week, there's a lot of people all around the world that are unable to do what we are doing right now. I mean, there's some states where churches are illegal. Um, gatherings of any size are illegal. There's some places in the world right now where Bibles are illegal. And there's different places where people will turn you in for a social credit score uh, to sort of build up the reputation on, on whatever it is uh, in their community for turning you in for looking at the Bible. So we have a distinct privilege that God has allowed us. So never take this for granted. Never take the Bible, the church, the service, the fellowship, because what we are experiencing right now could be taken away at any moment. And when we start to think about that, we know why it could be taken away at any moment, because the father of lies, the devil, the one in control of all the world's systems, he doesn't want us being together. He doesn't want us to have a gospel-centered community. So since the devil is such against us, us having church, meeting together, uh, he has infiltrated the world's systems. And public opinion is often swayed against what we are doing right now. The world is, has been corrupted uh, to its core. This corruption is almost everywhere because of the devil. And because of this corruption, the world is driven towards the removal of God and the destruction of what is holy. And I think we know that. And generally speaking, we know that, we understand that, the corruption in the world, we get it. And sometimes when you hear about a certain business, maybe that supports a LGBT agenda, you know what, it doesn't surprise me anymore. Because I know the world's corrupt. When you hear about maybe a restaurant that is uh, pro-death and they support this, the abortion industry, things like that, uh, it doesn't surprise me. All I think in my head is, is of course they do. Because the world is corrupt. I fully expect anymore, maybe I'm getting a little bit cynical, but I fully expect uh, nothing less than the most evil, the most anti-God agenda to be pushed to the front. I mean, when I hear about these big political money laundering schemes, pork stuff, and just a regular congressional bill, I'm not surprised. Because the world's corrupt. The world's evil. The world's sinful. The world is sort of dragged around on a leash by their father, the devil. And we know that, and we live in that, and we experience that on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is just part of the games people play. Corruption. Over the next six weeks, we're going to be looking at the book of Luke, and I've sort of made this a sub-series called Games People Play. And make no mistake about it, these games we're going to look at, these are the games that the world plays. They're Satan's games. And there's nothing more than what Satan would want us as born-again professing believers than to play these games as well. And oftentimes we get involved in these games that the world plays. Friends, what does that do for the cause of Christ? When believers get playing Satan's games, the world's games, what does it do for the cause of Christ? Pardon me? Destroys the cause of Christ. Harms the cause of Christ. What happens when a pastor runs off with a secretary? Thankfully, how old are you, Don? I'm not, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Thankfully, Don's old enough to be my mom, so we don't have that issue here. 
What happens when a, a deacon steals from the offering plate? When a Sunday school is a re- teacher is arrested for stalking a woman from his church? What happens to the testimony of the church and of Christ? It's harm, right? It's harm. So we need to avoid these gains. Here's a list of the sermons we're going to be doing out of Luke over the next few weeks, six weeks. Uh, corruption, reject, questioning authority, rejecting Christ. Let's change the subject. Does the world ever play that game? Oh, all the time. Denying reality. Do you ever see that in the world lately? They tell you one thing and you can see with your own eyes that that is not what is happening. And then the last sermon here, and, and, and eventually we will get there, is don't play these games with God. But our first one is on corruption. The world is corrupt. We see it all the time. You know, politicians, have you ever noticed this? They start off as normal people. And by the time they're done with their office, they're millionaires, multi-millionaires. I don't know if it's sweetheart deals or uh, campaign contributions or kickbacks or insider trading. Did you hear about that one politician this week that, that uh, right before they started pushing some electric car bill, the, the politician went out and bought a bunch of shares of Tesla. And then Tesla skyrocketed up because of this announcement, right? It, it's just corruption. Sometimes politicians, they get $100,000 for a 25-minute speech. That's, that's more money than Joel Olstein makes, right? That is, that is incredible money. Uh, uh, you, know, you know, when you hear about all these different things, you know that corrupt things are happening. Corruption. And I get it. People love money. They trust in money. And if you don't have Jesus, that's, that's all you have to live for. Find with me, if you would, Luke chapter 19, and you're going to see this corruption, this corruption going on in the city of Jerusalem. One lady was telling me, uh, she's like, oh, I'm going to miss Luke. I'm going to miss Luke when we're done with it. You know, we're almost to chapter 20. We're almost done with Luke, and I'm going to miss it when we're done. I counted. We have about 20 more sermons, okay? So you're going to be in Luke a, a long more time left. Um, so, uh, a few more months at least. But as we've read the book of Luke and sort of dug very deep into the book, we've looked at some nuances there in the book, and a couple times we've even had a little bit controversial interpretations. Um, as we've done that, there's this massive issue that keeps cropping up all over in the book of Luke. We see Jesus in the book of Luke. We see his perfection, his power, his compassion for the lost. We see his followers. We see their weaknesses and flaws. Then we see the population at large. Some of, some of them are coming to Jesus by faith, and others are just simply going after Jesus to get something for free, whether it's free food or, or free health care. And then we also see those religious leaders, don't we? The super-duper religious Pharisees and scribes and priests, wherever Jesus goes, they are always there. Whenever Jesus talks, they always have something to say, the counterpoint. And wherever Jesus goes and whatever he does, they always get offended. All the time. Whether we're reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, we see all throughout the Gospels that these these religious people get offended. Even when Jesus heals people, they get upset. When Jesus does a miracle, it offends them. Have you ever met someone like that? I'm sure you have. The church across the world is full of people like that. Instead of walking away and calming down and praying about it, these scribes, these Pharisees, these priests, instead of taking the high road, they refuse to back down and they continuously attack and antagonize Jesus and even plot against Jesus. You know, they've moved way beyond gossip. They've moved way beyond just building a coalition of people to be on their side. And they are all the way to plotting. 
they outright want to kill Jesus. And this last week of Jesus' life, their, their plotting will come to fruition. Well, Jesus knows that it's God's time for him to die, so he's going to push all the right buttons this week. He's going to push all the right buttons on these religious people. I mean, all throughout his ministry, Jesus has demanded people repent. He's told people to get their hearts right. But that's not really what upsets the Pharisees the most. And this week, he's going to go right to it. Do you know how to push buttons on some people? Do you know how to do that? Anybody want to admit that, right? There's certain people... Tell me if you agree with me on this or not. There's certain people that are easy. You know what I mean? They're easy to sort of get at. And, and you do one little thing and they're off, right? You, you set them off. Some people are just like that. They're easy. And in my younger days, I used to like to push those people's buttons. <laughs> Okay, I'm honest with you. I, I, used to, I used to like to do that. I was at college one time. We were eating with a bunch of guys. And, and, I, and I turned to the person next to me and I was talking uh, uh, to them about the person across the table. And my friend says, don't talk about people behind their back in front of them. <laughs> and I turned to the guy next to me and I said, he always does that. And you know that little like, plastic sword that they put like a, uh, a cherry on. He had ordered a cherry Coke and he'd eaten the cherries off of it and he threw the plastic sword at me. Right? Because I pushed that button. I, I got him going. I mean, was that just me or has anybody else here ever pushed somebody else's buttons in the past? Yeah? Dennis, you have? Thank you. Thank you. Probably the quickest way to get someone irritated is not to call them names, not to tell them that they are wrong, but to start affecting their bottom line, their pocketbook. Which is exactly what Jesus is going to do. He's going to confront the corruption of the priest and the Pharisees, and he's going to end their money train. You see, to the priest and the Pharisees, the biggest threat from Jesus was the money. Yeah, they didn't want to submit to his authority. Yeah, they, they resisted the conviction of the Holy Spirit. But they could have looked beyond those things, ignored those things. But they couldn't ignore how Jesus was stopping the money train. Let's start reading here in Luke 19, verse 45. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him. But they were unable to do anything, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. Jesus is obviously coming to start his kingdom. He talked about it all the time. He has been preaching about it over and over again over the last several weeks. He stopped in at least 35 different towns and villages preaching about the kingdom. The people know it. They are anticipating his great coming kingdom. And we talked about it a little bit last week. There's some tension in the air. There's messianic expectation. And where do you think these people, these crowds of people, where do you think they expected Jesus to go? Perhaps, perhaps they expected him to march right into Herod's palace and start making things right. You know, righting all the wrong social ills and fixing all these things, demanding equality. Or maybe they expected him to write, march right into the governor, uh, Roman governor Pilate, his, his fortress and expel him, throw out all the Roman soldiers and those evil tax collectors. I mean, if Jesus can heal a leper, if Jesus can walk on water, if he can 
feed thousands of people with a small boy's lunch, then certainly he can get rid of all the oppression in the land. But the crowds are noticing that Jesus doesn't take the road to Herod's, pal Herod's palace. He keeps walking. Huh, maybe he's going to the governor's palace. No, he, he, he doesn't go that way either. And instead, Jesus is going towards the temple. Why is he going to the temple? Yeah, he's going to the temple. What about the Romans? What about the social injustice going on in the world? What about the systematic racism and bigotry that's present all over the land? What about the people that are slaves? What about the men and women that have wrongfully, been wrongfully convicted and are locked up over there in Pilate's dungeon? What about the starving? What about the abused? Jesus skips all of that stuff and he goes to the temple and he begins to drive out the people who bought and sold there. I mean, this is the final week of Jesus' life on Friday. He's going to be killed, but he wakes up early. This is either like Monday or Tuesday morning, depending on uh, how you divide up the last days of his life. He wakes up very early in the morning, the day after his triumphal entry, and he heads straight to the temple. It's Passover time. There's lots and lots of people there. Everywhere there's people. Uh, regular people have come to town to do the sacrifices that they're required to do. Priests from the outlying areas have sort of come to reinforce and help with this massive amount of work. The Pharisees, of course, are there. Other groups are there. Large herds of animals are being brought into town that will be killed. Upwards of 250,000 sheep will be sacrificed. They dug up a, a tablet, a record, over 250,000 sheep sacrificed one year at Passover. The followers of Christ are there. And then we see bankers are there. Politicians are there. We know that tents would have been everywhere because people were jamming into the city by the, the thousands. Inns would be full. Residences would be full. Historians tell us that tents would actually line the city streets of Jerusalem. And, and in order for you to participate in the Passover activities, it was in that Jewish law. Remember all those extra Jewish law books? It was Jewish law that you had to stay the night in the city of Jerusalem. So there's tents everywhere, all around the city. They actually had to extend the uh, legal borders of the city of Jerusalem out beyond the walls to, in order to fit all the people in. So there's, it's packed. Jesus gets up, walks the two miles back to the temple from the city of Bethany, past all these tents, to confront the most corrupt thing in the land. In Christ's mind, the, the most corrupted thing in the land was the temple. You know, sometimes in our lives, at least in my life, I get all fixated on earthly things like, like the price of gas. By the way, did you notice that it's been going up? My son, uh, I don't think he's in here, right now. God bless my son. He wants the latest and greatest Xbox. He's been looking them up online and he'll leave that window open on my computer like it's a hint, right? Sometimes we get focused on earthly things. Which is what a lot of people wanted Jesus Christ to do. They wanted him to feed the poor. They wanted him to heal the sick. They wanted him to rid the country of Roman rule. They wanted Jesus to do all of those things, those earthly things, but Jesus bypasses all of that and he goes straight for the spiritual. He heads to the temple. Jesus is going to confront the spiritual, which is going to affect the pocketbook 
of the priests. And those are things that are going to get you in trouble really fast. Confronting the spiritual and confronting how a person gets and spends their money. So Jesus goes straight to the temple. The reason being is because this is Christ's mission. It's to reach and affect the spiritual and the heart. We just sang that song. Jesus wants the heart. And when Jesus arrives at the temple, he sees that it is totally corrupted. You know what the worst worst part about this was? It wasn't the Romans that had corrupted the temple. The Romans weren't in there selling stuff. This was the Jewish religious leaders. They had brought all these banking buddies in there who brought their friends that sold these overpriced animals and it was this gigantic money-making scheme that they had put in place. I think the average person kind of looked at all this chaos and all these people jammed in the temple for what it was. They knew it was a scam. The common man was being swindled so that the priests could make a lot of money. Now, officially in scriptures, this is the second time that Jesus has cleansed the temple. He did it once early on in his ministry uh, when he made a whip. You remember that? The, the Bible says he crafted a whip to drive people out. I think that's John 2. Now this, again, he does it again. In his last few days of ministry, he goes to the temple to clean it out again. But what's interesting is nothing has changed. The corrupt folks hadn't learned their lesson from the time before, but Jesus is going to go in there again because he can't handle it. I listened to a lot of sermons this past week on this text, and one pastor said if Jesus was alive today, he wouldn't go to the UN building in New York City. He wouldn't go to Washington, D.C. He would go to the churches. He would go to the churches and and clean them out and call for true and pure worship because that's what he cares about. Verse 45. Jesus goes up to the temple. Up on the screen is an aerial view of the temple. It's a large outer court, also called the Court of the Gentiles, the biggest area. You see the walls around there, and the the largest area is called the Court of the Gentiles. That total area of the temple complex is about 36 acres. So it's a huge area. And this outer court, they could fit thousands and thousands of people and hundreds of priests would be there. And they would be sacrificing animals. And there would be these tables set up with these money changers because you had this special temple tax to pay and they only allowed one currency. So you would have to take the money, your currency that you had, whether it's a certain gold piece or a silver piece, and you'd have to trade it for the the legal currency that they allowed in the temple. Plus there were the animal sellers. Of course there would be beggars there. They would stand near the various gates hoping uh, and praying for assistance from people as they walked by. And this is the scene Jesus enters into this outer court. And Jesus is horrified by what he sees. He's appalled by what he sees. This crooked business selling animals. During that time, there was two high priests that sort of rotated back and forth. That was against Jewish law as well, technically, but this is what they did. It was a man named Annas and another man named Caiaphas. They were in charge of this entire thing. Historians tell us that they sold franchises to make money. They they sold tables, booths, and they they charged for that, that section of ground where the booth was going to be set up. Then they charged for the table itself. And then they they uh, took a certain percentage of all the sales that took place. And hundreds of people wanted to be part of this. And they jam into this 36-acre temple mount. 
Now, maybe you're an industrious kind of person and you're thinking, I raise sheep at my house. Nathan, you might be thinking, I'm going to bring our best lamb. And you're going to travel uh, hours and hours and hours with your entire family. And you're going to bring your best sheep. What do you think those priests are going to do? They're going to find a little spot on that sheep. And they're going to say, look here, I found it. It's right here in this spot. We, and they're going to reject that sheep so that you buy their sheep at ten times what it's actually worth. I mean, it is just uh, pure evil what is going on there. Corruption. The temple had essentially become a filthy stockyard. This chaotic mess. And when Jesus walked in and saw all of that, it made him angry. They say even the doves. The doves were the sacrifice that the poorest of the poor would buy because they couldn't afford a sheep. They say the doves were even outrageously overpriced. This is a travesty. On top of that, I didn't even mention the money changers charged 25% rate to change the money. Outrageous. This is vile. This is evil. These are crooks and cons that have gathered in the temple to swindle the people. I mean, it's totally corrupt, and Jesus couldn't stand it. And he barges in, and what does he say? What does he call the place? He says, this is my house. He says, you've turned my house into a den of thieves. You've corrupted my house. Because of this, he began to drive out the people who were responsible for this mess. As I studied the passage this week, I just thought in my head, how much power and authority did Jesus have? One guy to drive out hundreds, if not thousands of people out of a 36-acre area. That's a lot of power. I'm sure there were some people that fought, that they didn't want to leave their stuff behind. There were some people that resisted because they made a lot of money and Jesus threw them all out. Jesus didn't walk in there and say, you guys need to stop. You guys need to stop, okay? Could we do this outside of the temple, uh, another area? No. Read some of the other passages in, in Matthew and Mark. Jesus flipped over tables. One phrase kind of implies that Jesus kicked over stools. You're sitting there on a stool, like trying to sell your doves in these little cages, and Jesus kicks the stool out from under you. According to Mark, Jesus didn't let any of them carry anything out. Their money, their animals. I mean, how much power? One guy, 36 acres. How long did it take him to do that? Uh, but Jesus emptied the place of all the corruption. I think it would have been a sight to see. One pastor said he can't wait till he gets to heaven. He's going to put in this DVD. He wants to watch it. Question is, right, you know what's coming. I wonder what Jesus would do in our church if he showed up here. What would he do in other churches if he showed up there? Would Jesus do any kicking? I know for certain we see God hates an impure worship. He hates corruption. Jesus also says, very interesting, he says, this is a house of prayer. I really like that, that phrase. We could spend a lot of time talking about prayer, couldn't we? A lot of time talking about prayer. We know that prayer is praise. We know prayer is speaking to God. We know sometimes prayer is asking for help, uh, a request. But remember what time this is for the Jewish people. It's Passover time. It's the time when they are sacrificing animals for their sins that they've done all year long. So these people should have been there praying, seeking forgiveness for their sins. 
Well, how could you ask forgiveness for sins when you're being raped over the coals by these uh, exorbitantly priced animals and everything else that is going on there? Isaiah 56, 7 says, God says, says, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. So the temple was intended to be a place of prayer, a place of worship, a place of confession. Instead, there was chaos and extortion. Jesus cleaned all that up, at least twice. But they would go right back to it. About 40 years later, in AD 70, Jerusalem was leveled. The entire temple gone. You know what? It's never been rebuilt. And it was torn down because it had become a den of thieves instead of a house of prayer. Verse 47. Verse 47 tells us why Jesus wanted it cleaned out. He wanted to teach. He wanted to preach there. And in fact, every day during this final week of his life, he was there early in the morning, first thing, teaching in the temple. Luke chapter 20, verse 1, just skip ahead there. Uh, you can see that in your Bible. It tells us that Jesus was preaching the gospel every day. Jesus was inviting people to be saved. Well, how could you teach and preach if there's thousands of crooks and animals everywhere? Jesus, in his last few days before the cross, wanted to give out the gospel a few more times. And the Bible says the people packed the place to hear him. How many people could you fit in that 36 acres? That was Jesus' goal. In closing this morning, I have a question for you to consider. If you knew you only had three or four days left on this earth, what would you do? What would you do? Spend time with family? Perhaps do that one thing you always wanted to do? Maybe it's ride a bull or go skydiving or whatever it is. Maybe it's maybe a little bit easier. Maybe just, I want one more chicken dinner in Frankenhoof. You know, my last three or four days. I just... One more dinner in Frankenmuth. What would you do if you had three or four days? Well, the thing is, none of us have that luxury of knowing whether or not we have three or four days left, but Jesus did. And in that three or four days, he confronted sin and corruption, and he used that time to give out the gospel. The only thing I can say is what an incredible example I mean, that's what Jesus is all about, seeking and saving the lost. Let's clear this place out so we can give the gospel. Let's pray. Father God, we're thankful for this lesson that uh, we see once again this incredible example from our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, there's nothing higher, nothing better that we could attain to than, than your Son, Jesus. And I pray that that would be a thought on our minds. Lord, that we would strive to be like Jesus. Lord, at times, give us the boldness to confront corruption. Lord, uh, at other times, give us the boldness to preach the gospel. Give us clarity of thought when we're doing it, so that we don't make a fool of ourselves. Lord, I, I pray for our country, Lord. The United States needs a lot of prayer, a lot of help, a, a, a miracles, Lord. There's so much corruption in this land. Political corruption, corporate corruption, corruption in churches. Lord, so many churches are, aren't really even preaching the Bible. Lord not even preaching the gospel. Some of the biggest named preachers on TV don't even really give out the gospel. Father, it's, it's corruption. And Lord, the only way around it is for you to work. For people to repent. 
for people to decide to follow you and your son with all their hearts. Lord God, we can worry about it, we can think about it, but the best thing to do is to pray about it. So Lord, I pray that you would work in this terrible corruption all across the land. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take your hymnals, 473. We'll stand together as we sing the full of the Come. tonight, uh, Habakkuk, that last uh, sermon out of Habakkuk chapter 3. It's been done a few weeks when we've had other things to do on, the, on Sunday nights, but um, or watch it online. That's fine too, but we'll see you later.